Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Today, I want to share with you seven Catholic things that every Protestant should try. So I love my Catholic faith. I love my Protestant friends, Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, the Protestants who watch my YouTube channel and benefit from my pro-life arguments or my case for the existence of God. And because I love my Catholic faith and it brings me peace, joy, comfort, I want to share that with everybody. But today I want to focus on parts of the Catholic faith that I feel like any Protestant can embrace, and it should not have any tension with their theology, especially you know, if they believe in sola scriptura, by scripture alone, sola fide, justification by faith alone. What I want to share today that I found helpful does not contradict any of that. And so if it's been a spiritual blessing to my life, I want it to be a spiritual blessing to yours as well. So whether you're Protestant listening or you're a Catholic who has Protestant friends or family, I hope that you get a lot out of this. Now, some people, some Protestants may say, well, the things that you're sharing, yeah, they don't contradict the Bible, but they're also not found in the Bible. So that's why I have a, why they would have a problem with it. But there's a fair number of Protestant practices that are not found in the Bible as well. So you think about the sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask your forgiveness. Come into my heart. Forgive me. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior, or something like that. A lot of Protestant uh, salvation tracts, uh, evangelism tracts, will have some variant of saying the sinner's prayer to Jesus, but the Bible never says we should say the sinner's prayer to Jesus. Nothing like this is in the Bible. Uh, the Bible doesn't have things like altar calls, uh, Bible studies as we would know them today. The Bible doesn't talk about going to church, for example, in a particular building. That developed centuries later. Uh, but just because, but many Protestants will say, yeah, just because it's not explicitly described in the Bible doesn't mean that it's prohibited. And I would agree. So the things that I want to share, they may not be in Scripture, but they're certainly not contradicted by Scripture in any way. So let's jump right into them. And this is in no particular order, by the way. So seven, we'll start at one, no particular order. Number one, making the sign of the cross. So this is something, it's not distinctly Catholic, because the Eastern Orthodox do this as well. Some Protestants also make the sign of the cross, but many Protestants I know usually don't. So the sign of the cross, of course, when we uh, take your fingers, touch your forehead in the name of the Father, then to your, uh, like your sternum, your chest in the name of the Son, and then across your shoulders in the name of the Holy Spirit, left to right in the West, right to left in the East. Uh, but most Protestants will have seen Catholics cross their shoulders from left to right. So making the sign of the cross, where does this come from? I'm glad you asked. Our earliest reference to the sign of the cross comes from the ecclesial writer Tertullian. He lived in North Africa at the beginning of the third century. This is what he writes. We Christians wear out our foreheads with the sign of the cross. So there's also variants of it. Some of it is just making a small cross on your forehead. So this is the sign of the cross. You can also make it with the forehead, the chest, and the shoulders. But this goes all the way back to the early church. And there's a great story on this that my friend Joe Heschmeyer told at the Catholic Answers Conference that I definitely want to tell you about the efficacy of this particular uh, function of prayer, of including the bodily movement of the sign of the cross when we pray. It takes place during the reign of the Roman Emperor Diocletian at the beginning of the 4th century. So Diocletian uh, launched a very vicious persecution of Christians. This actually took place after a time period in the 3rd century that was called the Little Peace of the Church, that finally the Church was now, you know, getting along for a while with the Roman Empire, live and let live, and then Diocletian just blew that all to heck and started mercilessly persecuting Christians. And one reason he did that was he felt that his military defeats and problems to the empire were because Christians were not honoring the pagan gods. And so there's a story that the church father Lactantius tells in the 4th century, and this is recounted uh, also by Eusebius of Caesarea talks about this. So it says, Diocletian, as being of a timorous disposition, was a searcher into futurity. He, he would go and see seers, fortune tellers, people who tell him the future. And during his abode in the East, when he's out fighting the Parthians, people in the Eastern Empire, he began to slay victims that from their livers he might obtain a prognostic of events. This is called uh, reading 
entrails that soothsayers would look at animals or human entrails and read them to try to discover the future. Don't ask me how it works. I don't do this stuff. This is what people did back then. It says, while he sacrificed, some attendants of his who were Christians stood by, and they put the immortal, the immortal sign on their foreheads, the sign of the cross. At this, the demons were chased away, and the holy rites interrupted. The soothsayers, fortune tellers, trembled, unable to investigate the wanted marks on the entrails of the victim. So here we have an early testimony that one reason Diocletian persecuted Christians was because in making the sign of the cross— they did something that agitated demons and made them leave, and these pagan fortune tellers couldn't pursue their, their dark arts as a result. So it's powerful. It's something that orders our day. The, the Catechism of the Catholic Church describes it this way in paragraph 2157. The Christian begins his day, his prayers, and his activities with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The baptized person dedicates the day to the glory of God and calls on the Savior's grace, which lets him act in the Spirit as a child of the Father. The sign of the cross strengthens us in temptations and difficulties. So at the very least, if you're Protestant, you understand there's a proper posture for prayer. Your head's lowered, maybe you're on your knees, your hands are clasped together, or hands are out. But what we do with our bodies matters during prayer, and this is a wonderful reminder of our baptism, of the Trinity— uh, I think it's great, and there's no reason not to do it, because the cross should always be in the center of our lives as Christians. Paul says that we, we glory, let me not boast in anything except for the, the cross of Christ. Uh, here's number two, fasting and Lent. So some of these I've, I've combined together. So this is just practicing fasting. Now, fasting itself is not necessarily religious. I practice intermittent fasting, for example. It's just a fancy way of saying that I don't eat breakfast and I don't eat snacks. I just eat a meal at lunch and I eat a meal at dinner. It's been really good for my health. So fasting is something that is just good for us in general. It sharpens our mind. It helps us. The more you can learn to say no to bodily desires, the easier it will be to say no to the devil and to resist his temptations. It helps us to, it helps us to grow spiritually. And in fact, Jesus, in instructing his followers, assumes that they will fast, because he says in Matthew 6.16 6, that when you fast, do not, be, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Do not, hey guys, this fasting is so hard, and you believe how hard this is, because, and you do it just to get other people's attention. It's fine if people know that you're fasting, or if they know that you're praying. Uh, if, you know, Jesus, you know, some Protestants may say, well, Trent, Jesus says to do these things in secret. Well, many Protestants also pray in public, even though Jesus says to pray in private. You might pray at, uh, you know, you pray at church, or you'll pray with people in front of a pornography store or an abortion facility, or you'll be at a prayer revival. Praying in public and fasting in public are fine, as long as you don't make a show of it so that you can get attention from people, rather as you're trying to glorify God through practicing self-denial. So, and that's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, not if you fast, but he assumes that his followers will practice fasting, and they did do that. Acts 13, 2, for example, uh, says this, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So we see that fasting and prayer is something done in the early church before important decisions are made. Fasting brings us closer to God. So I would say, try fasting. Well, here's an idea. Maybe on Friday, you could give up something important to you. Chocolate, meat, uh, I don't know what it might be. Because it's a sacrifice you can make on Friday, because our Lord made the ultimate sacrifice for us on Friday, so we could have eternal life. Now people are thinking, Tran, are you just trying to get Protestants more comfortable with Catholic practices if they ever convert? Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. If it happens, if it happens, you never know. But regardless, uh, it should do spiritual good to practice fasting, grow closer to God. And you could even practice that over a period of days leading up to Easter, for example. That's the period of Lent, or in the Eastern Church, we call that the Great Fast. Uh, that's the idea that before we can really rejoice in the Easter season— we go into the desert and we practice self-denial so that we can be more spiritually prepared to celebrate the joy of the resurrection. 
Number three is to refer to Mary as the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, many Protestants will already call Mary the Virgin Mary, and Virgin is used here as kind of a title to underscore the, the wonderful, glorious miracle that is the virgin birth, that Christ was born of a woman, but he did not have an earthly father. He had an adoptive father, Joseph, but his father is our father, who is in heaven, because Christ is fully God and fully man. And to talk about the miracle of the Incarnation and to underscore that, Protestants will often refer to Mary as the Virgin Mary. So I'm just saying, why not add one more appendage to that title? The Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, why would we do that? Well, Mary herself in Luke chapter 1 says we will do that, that believers will do this. In Luke 1, verses 48 through 49, Mary says in her song to God, her Magnificat, Henceforth, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And so, in honoring Mary and speaking of her with uh, these titles. And think about when the angel Gabriel uh, even addressed Mary in Luke chapter 1. He does not say, even though Catholics say, Hail Mary, full of grace. In Luke chapter 1, the angel, in Luke one twenty eight, Gabriel does not say, Hail Mary, full of grace. He instead addresses her as a title, Hail Kakaratomene, translated favored one, grace-filled one, full of grace, favored daughter. That's not a great translation, but it's fine. So in referring to her in this way, by understanding the important role of Mary in salvation, we can imitate her, that she said yes to God in receiving Christ, even when it was a, a scary thing that didn't entirely make sense. She says, how, how am I to uh, conceive? How is this going to happen? But she chose to trust in God, and Mary is the model uh, disciple for Christians. And as Catholics, we believe that she is the spiritual mother to all Christians, and she continually prays for us. But even if you don't believe that, if you're Protestant, you can at least follow what Mary says here and call her not just the Virgin Mary, but the Blessed Virgin Mary, because all generations will call her blessed. That's what Scripture says. All right, number four, hang up a crucifix in your home and other religious art. Now, many Protestants have difficulty with religious art. They'll see Catholic statues and churches or crucifixes, and they'll say, well, doesn't this violate the, the Ten Commandments, the, the Second Commandment, as they'll number it? Thou shalt not make a graven image. Now, what's interesting here is if you took that literally, it's, it says in the book of Exodus, thou shalt not make a graven image of anything on the earth, under the earth, which would mean you couldn't make any art at all. Though some Protestants will say, well, what they're really saying here is that we should not have religious depictions of God. Uh, you know, we shouldn't try to depict God because God does not have a physical body. We, we don't want to become idolaters. And that was understandable at the time uh, Exodus was written, because God had not become incarnate yet. But Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus Christ is the image of the Father, literally the icon of the Father. God made himself an icon. He took physical form for us. And so we can represent that to better understand Jesus. So I really don't understand a Protestant criticism that would say, well, I don't want to have an image of Jesus on a crucifix because that takes away from Christ's glory. We're not supposed to make uh, visual representations of Jesus. And yet many of those Protestants have no problem with nativity displays showing the baby Jesus in the manger. They have no problem with children's coloring books that have Jesus in them. That's an image of Jesus. Does that take away from his glory? No, not at all. Many of those same Protestants who would not put a crucifix on their wall will watch Jesus being crucified in a film or television show, maybe something like The Chosen or The Passion of the Christ. So how could it be bad to have one visual medium depicting a crucified Jesus, like a crucifix, but another visual medium, like a film or a television show? That's okay. It seems to me to be, it's a double standard. But at the very least, religious artwork and crucifixes, even if it's not a crucifix, some religious art. I love icons, for example, because they have an otherworldly feel about them, that they aren't photorealistic depictions. It allows me to enter into them knowing that this is not exactly what Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary look like or the apostles, but it provides this very special window for me to meditate and think about them, and to meditate upon the mysteries of the faith. 
At the very least, I think it's good to have these religious images up because if we don't, a lot of times we just end up putting pictures of ourselves all over our homes. And do we need to constantly be reminded about who we are and the fun things we do? I think if we're going to be reminded of something throughout our day, it doesn't need to be us. It should be God and holy men and women and saints who imitated God and stand as spiritual examples to us. So that'd be something I definitely recommend. All right, number five. Uh, I might have said number five before, but this is real number five. Pray to the Holy Spirit and pray for the dead. This is another combo here. The first one shouldn't be controversial, right? Protestants agree we can pray to God. Some of them will say, well, you can only pray to the Father through the Son with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible never says who we can or can't pray to here, though it's interesting, if you're a Protestant who prays to Jesus or prays to the Holy Spirit, that's great, but the Bible never actually says to do that. It has a few examples of praying to Jesus, but the Bible doesn't really have any prayers to the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times people treat the Holy Spirit as a what rather than a who. But the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He is the counselor, the one that Jesus gave us. And so the Holy Spirit is the person who allows us to pray effectively to God, who animates our prayers. So why wouldn't we pray directly to the Holy Spirit? Why wouldn't we we pray, Holy Spirit, inflame the hearts of your faithful, enkindle in them the fire of your love? That Praying to the Holy Spirit, cultivating that relationship with each member of the Trinity is a good thing, and there are many great Catholic prayers to the Holy Spirit. Now, the next one I admit is going to be a little more controversial. Pray for the dead. Many Protestants will say, well, why would I pray for the dead? They're either in heaven, where they don't need my prayers, or they're in hell, where my prayers aren't going to help them anyway. So why would you pray for the dead? Uh, okay, so just setting aside the question of purgatory, I would say this, that you we don't know the state of someone's soul uh, at the moment that they died. Now, you might be saying, well, how could my prayers after they've died change the state of their souls in the past? Well, that's the great thing, that God is outside of time. Now, some Protestants don't believe God is outside of time, but I hope you can agree that God is all-knowing and he's all-powerful, So now some Protestants don't believe God knows the future, but I think a lot of Protestants watching my channel would believe that even if God is in time, he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing. He works all things to good. He predestines. He has perfect knowledge of the future. And so if we pray in the future, after someone has died, for them to have died in God's friendship, for them to have been saved, to pray for their soul, then God can apply that prayer to the past, our encouragement for that person to actually die in friendship with God, to have been saved when they left this earthly life. Because if God, like I said, God is timeless, so he can apply how we pray in the future to an event in the past where his will has not been uh, revealed. So I can't pray, for example, that Abraham Lincoln will not be shot in Ford's theater. That's already happened. God's will has been revealed in that, in that case. But I can pray that Abraham Lincoln was in a state of grace, that he died in God's friendship, that he was saved, uh, that, and that he'll go to heaven, because we don't know the state of his soul at that, at that moment. Uh, so God, knowing that I prayed even at this time, 150, 160 years later, can apply that retroactively to the past. God is the Lord of all of space and time, all-powerful, all-knowing. Why can't he do that? In fact, two pieces of evidence here for a practice of praying for the dead. Paul may have prayed for the dead in his uh, second letter to Timothy. He talks about uh, Onesiphorus. And so he says, May the Lord grant mercy— this is 2 Timothy 1, 17-18. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me eagerly and found me. And verse 18 is interesting. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So if Onesiphorus had died when Paul is writing 2 Timothy, then it seems like Paul is praying that Onesiphorus will find mercy from God on that day, the day of judgment. Uh, and that, so he's praying for someone who died. Now, the way around that, I'm not saying this is a full proof, by the way. Some people will say, well, it's not clear that Onesiphorus has actually died. He could still be alive, and Paul is praying for him to 
to find mercy at the judgment day? Maybe, but I, but I think a lot of people also say it seems like he has died by this point. Though even though he's died, some people say that Paul isn't really praying for him. He's offering a wishful hope, but it kind of sounds like a prayer, doesn't it? I mean, a, 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 some call it a, a wish prayer or a prayer wish. That's still a prayer, but it's not a full proof, but I do think it's interesting here, this uh, prayer about Onesiphorus. Also, this was very common in the early church. One of the earliest references comes from the second century, and it's a headstone of a bishop named uh, Abersius, called the Abersius Stone. And on there, it simply says, pray for Abersius. In the catacombs where Christians hid out during Roman persecution, we've discovered a lot of art and graffiti. A lot of these are inscriptions asking saints to pray for them, not just for people visiting the catacombs to pray for these individuals, pray for Paulos, you know, pray for Thecla, pray for Felicity, whatever the, the different names, pray for Marcellinus, not just asking visitors to the catacombs, they actually ask Paul, St. Paul and St. Peter, the apostles, to pray for them, pray, you know, pray for my soul. But at the very least, we see in the early church a belief in praying for the dead, to pray for somebody, because you don't know the state of their soul when they died. And we should always, even especially if you, you might say, oh, I don't know how they were doing at the end of their life, they were kind of backsliding, don't know how committed they were in their faith, and they died, and you're not at peace, and you worry about them, pray for them. God's all-powerful. He can use your prayers for good and stretch their effects beyond the space-time continuum. So pray for the dead. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, and the Bible absolutely does not prohibit in any way, shape, or form praying for someone who has died, that God will have mercy on them. All right, number six, go on a pilgrimage. All right, so Pope Benedict XVI talked about pilgrimages in this way. To go on pilgrimage is not simply to visit a place to admire its treasures of nature, art, or history. To go on pilgrimage really means to step out of ourselves in order to encounter God where he has revealed himself, where his grace is shown with particular splendor and produced rich fruits of conversion and holiness among those who believe. I like this part. Above all, Christians go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to the places associated with the Lord's passion, death, and resurrection. And for me, the best pilgrimage I've ever been on—well, actually, it's the only pilgrimage— uh, No, I've been on other pilgrimages before. I I've been to pilgrimages here in the U.S., to particular abbeys and monasteries, but the best pilgrimage I have ever been on is to the Holy Land, to walk where Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, uh, to sit on the place where the Sermon of, of the Mount was held, to go to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, to walk through the old city of Jerusalem, and to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where our Lord, the spot where our Lord was crucified, to touch that rock where he was crucified, to touch the inside of the tomb where he was buried. I mean, I felt electricity running through me when that happened. I've never had a spiritual experience like that since then. And I would be so overjoyed for any Christian, Protestant, Orthodox, whoever it may be, any, especially my Protestant brothers and sisters, to be able to experience that as well. So go on a pilgrimage to go to these places where our Lord worked his miracles to draw close to that. Whoever's watching this, well worth your time to go on a pilgrimage. I'm hoping to do a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in May or June. I'm still working out the details when it comes through. I'll let you guys know. But I'd love for anyone to, to join me on that. It will, it'll change your life. But if you're a Protestant who goes to the Holy Land, I do challenge you. There are two tombs of Jesus. So there's the one at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the traditional tomb. There's another one in a garden area that was discovered in the 19th century. It's very popular among Protestants because it's very picturesque. It's in a garden. It's cut out of a, a hole in a wall. It's outside. It feels like the, seeing Jesus's tomb as you would see it in an illustrated Bible. It's like, oh, this is what it would have looked like if I were there. So many people do go there and call it Jesus's tomb, but historically, we know that this was not Jesus's tomb. Uh, it's called the Garden Tomb. This historically is not the correct site. So I would encourage you to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, archaeologically, it's discovered outside of the old city walls of the first century because Jesus was taken beyond the city gates to be killed and crucified. It was not done in the city, as the letter to the Hebrews says. And so in doing that, you're right there at the spot. There's really good evidence, this, this discovered by Constantine and Helena in the fourth century. Well, we know that this is probably the spot 
because to keep Christians away from this site, the Emperor Hadrian built the temple to Jupiter Maximus on top of this site. And so it kind of marked it since the second century where Jesus was buried. And so then later, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built on this site. And though you go inside, it's a gigantic church. Like you go to, remember I said Jesus's garden tomb is outdoors? Jesus's tomb, the Rock of Calvary, it's inside this massive church complex. Uh, And it feels very Catholic. It actually feels very Orthodox with the particular kinds of candles and uh, masses that are being said, divine liturgies, but it's beautiful. The best experience of my life was walking in there 5 a.m. Easter Sunday when I was in Jerusalem a few years ago to celebrate divine liturgies Easter Sunday morning. So let's uh, let's go on a pilgrimage. They're, they're awesome. Well worth it. All right, the last one, number seven, pray the divine office and the Jesus prayer. So there's a wonderful app on my phone that has the breviary. It's called the breviary, Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office. Uh, it's called, as you would expect, it's called Divine Office. Maybe I can hold this up there for you. You can see that there. This is the universal prayer of the Catholic Church that is said throughout the world at specific times of day. It goes back to the Jewish practice of saying prayers morning and evening. So all around the world, Catholics are saying these prayers. And I love the Divine Office app because you can actually have it read to you aloud with hymns. And the prayers should not be objectionable. If there's a prayer to Mary you don't like, just skip over that if you're not ready to pray that. But most of them are just praying the Psalms, uh, praying the Psalms, praying uh, readings from the Gospels, asking for the Lord's intercession, praying the Our Father. It's a great way to have a regular pattern prayer life so that prayer becomes second nature. Uh, so I definitely recommend getting the Divine Office. Just get it, try one of them, see if you're comfortable with it. Uh, it might be a change up in prayer instead of just making spontaneous, extemporaneous prayers to God, meditating upon these reflections from Scripture, these intercessions, they're themed for the day. Uh, they have some nice readings from the saints to think about as well. I would definitely recommend that. But to have uh, a special uh, regularity in prayer, I'd also recommend the Jesus Prayer. This is one that is very common among Eastern Christians. In fact, I've been going to an Eastern Catholic Church for a long time now, but one of the first prayers in my conversion experience that really attracted me to Catholicism was this prayer. I didn't even know that it had an Eastern origin to it. And it's a very simple prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. And it's phrased in a variety of ways. I usually pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some people will even shorten it more. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy that's if they say it over and over again throughout the day to wait as a way to meditate. So if you're Protestant but you don't like the rosary, you're not quite there yet, you can just get prayer beads and say the Jesus prayer and just say over and over again to meditate, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Now Jesus says vain repetition is bad. That's right. You don't say it over and over again to get points because you said it a thousand times. But there are psalms like, uh, bless the Lord, sun and dew, bless the Lord, fire and earth. There are psalms that are repetitive, but they're not vain repetitions. This is something you can just say throughout the day to keep Jesus at the center uh, of your life. Uh, so I love it, the Jesus prayer, probably my favorite prayer. Lord, And I pray it this way, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So that is, so to summarize all what I went through, the seven things that Protestants can try, right now. Seven Catholic things every Protestant should try. The sign of the cross, fasting and Lent, uh, referring to Mary as the Blessed Virgin Mary, putting religious artwork in your home, especially a crucifix, praying to the Holy Spirit and praying for the dead, going on a pilgrimage, and saying the Divine Office and the Jesus Prayer. Those are seven. I'm sure we could do another episode with seven more I think you would enjoy, but I hope these are a good start. Thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.